Hello everybody and welcome back to Witch Fix. Today we are finally looking at a book that I bought a while ago after I read uh, another one by the same author. Today we're looking at The Sugar Queen by Sarah Addison Allen. You might remember that uh, way back in the mists of time, I think over a year ago now, I read uh, one of uh, Allen's books which was Garden Spells. I have the sequel to that which is First Frost but at the end of that one they gave the blurb for this other standalone novel called The Sugar Queen and it spoke to me. I was very interested in reading it. I do love a, a good cutesy kitsch book usually focused around like a sweet shop for some reason i thought this was about a sweet shop but it turned out it wasn't but i stand by my assessment that it is very sweet and very cute uh so the bu the blurb on the back of the book is thus 27 year old josie is sure of three things winter in her north carolina hometown is her favorite season She's a sorry excuse for a southern belle, and sweets are best eaten in the privacy of her hidden closet. For while Josie has settled into an uneventful life in her mother's house, her one consolation is the stockpile of sugary treats and paperback romances she escapes to each night, until she finds her closet harbouring none other than local waitress Della Lee Baker, a tough-talking, tender-hearted woman who is one part nemesis and two parts fairy godmother. I read this over the last couple of days, and I'm going to give trigger warnings because it does deal with issues such as suicide, uh, domestic abuse and murder uh, none of which is I would say hugely graphic but the themes definitely are in there so if you have a, a, an issue with being triggered by those themes being present in films like Practical Magic for example I would avoid this book because it's the same level of involvement I did quite like this book I, I enjoyed it there is a sort of central mystery which isn't really a mystery because it's kind of blatantly obvious what's happening um, but to its credit the book never really plays that mystery as if it is an actual mystery it drops so many hints and so many clues that I think it's kind of purposeful that the reader is meant to know what's going on but Josie the main character isn't this review is quite spoiler heavy so if you don't want to have this mystery spoiled for you stop listening now go read the book and then come back I'll wait for you have they gone good so at the start of the book Josie wakes up and finds Della Lee in her closet Della Lee is wet has like mascara all over her face and only has one shoe on and says that she's hiding in in the closet and then she refuses to leave and lives in there for several weeks during which time Various things happen, there are various comments uh, and, and things throughout the story that make it quite clear that Della Lee is definitely dead. Not least that the back of the book says that she's part fairy godmother, so sh she's a real person, but it is implying there is something magical about her, and sure enough, by the end of the novel, we do find out that she actually died prior to her appearance in the closet. This is handled quite well, and as I said, it is kind of obvious as you read the book that something very strange is going on. Uh, Della Lee even says when she shows up that she decided to take a swim in the river and then just ended up at Josie's house. So you can put that together. Um, the main plot in the book is about Josie sort of overcoming her crippling shyness and her fear of disappointing her mother enough that she can go and live out her dreams and find love and all those things that are present in a lot of romantic comedies. There's also a subplot about a lady called Chloe Finlay who becomes Josie's friend. She recently found out that her boyfriend cheated on her because he told her and is debating whether or not to get back together with him and wants to know who he cheated on her with but he won't tell her so that's kind of another mystery. A third storyline is about Josie's mother who's a an elderly woman at this point but it's about how her marriage to Josie's father who's kind of the hero of this small town uh, kind of wasn't as good as it was cracked up to be. He isn't the hero that Josie thinks he is and that her mother actually had an affair and was really in love with somebody else but didn't get to be with them and how this has kind of soured her against both Josie and the town in general. I wasn't wild about this storyline because to put it bluntly, Josie's mum is a massive bitch and doesn't deserve any kind of happiness and debatably doesn't even get happiness at the end of the book uh, because it definitely doesn't seem like she's ever going to really escape from this town and all of the things that are bad about it and all the terrible memories. But it's wrapped up enough that I guess it's satisfactory even though it isn't what I would call a happy ending. 
Now, Chloe was kind of the most interesting character to me, uh, aside from Josie, the main character, because Chloe is the only one with what I would call an overt magical ability. In Garden Spells, you might remember that everyone had these individual powers or kind of gifts, I would say, more than powers. So, for example, Claire, with her knowing about what potions and special dishes to make for people sydney with her being able to tell everything about person by their haircut and another character who would just show up at your house and give you something that she suddenly knew you needed in this chloe's really kind of the only person with that gift and her gift is books books just appear around her they show up when she needs them and throughout the novel she is stalked by several self-help books that just keep following her around her apartment she throws them in the bin only to have them appear at her place of work they appear on ceiling fans they're also characterized like we get told that books don't like going in the bathroom because it's wet in there and they get scared of water and she even talks to them as well and when she's sort of avoiding one book and goes into another room to see another one waiting for her she refers to it as like a pincer attack uh, which i found really funny and it was very kind of whimsical and delightful which is what i expected the book to be there isn't a huge amount of stuff like that elsewhere in the book there is like a village wise woman who josie goes to to buy peppermint oil which her mum insists on having on all the doors and window seals to prevent uninvited visitors popping by we don't get to see a lot of this wise woman she only appears in like one scene when they go and visit her and uh, there's also the maid who works for Josie's mum whose name is Marlena but who gets referred to as Helena the entire book because that Josie and her mum can't be bothered to learn her name uh, she is from a very I would say superstitious background and she seems to be able to sense Della Lee's ghost or whatever in the building and keeps like giving Josie charms made out of like animal bones and sewing crucifixes into the hems of her clothing to try and protect her from this unseen evil force which Josie misinterprets as an awareness uh, that Helena knows there is an intruder in the house although it is again very obvious that she's referring to a spiritual presence. I didn't know how to feel about the character of Helena because from the way that she doesn't really speak good English and the way that that is conveyed to the fact that her employers don't even know her real name. They just call her by something that they think is her name. And the way she's kind of shown as being, I guess, ignorant and credulous in her beliefs does feel very racist. I don't know if it's meant to be a comment on that because at the end we find out that the reason that she purposefully gets Josie and Margaret's names wrong is because it's sort of a retaliation for them never learning her name properly but it's still a little bit weird and a little bit uncomfortable so I'm going to mention that. Josie's love interest in the novel is her postman who I guess her power is that she always seems to know when he's about to arrive. At the beginning of the book she can like sense him walking towards the house uh, as if feeling this kind of pull from him. I think that's really her only demonstrated natural ability um, but they fall in love. I don't really get why I think I had a problem with the the romance storyline in love in garden spells as well. I just didn't find it that interesting. It was kind of formulaic. They fall in love because they're two characters in a romance novel, I guess, uh, which is all fine and dandy. I didn't necessarily have a problem with that, but it just didn't seem very believable that they would have anything in common uh, or very believable that everything she hates about herself is is stuff that he loves. It just seemed a little bit contrived, um, but then it was okay as a, as a facet of the story. Chloe's the main cause, I would say, of issues and stuff that arise in the plot. Uh, she, in a retaliation for her boyfriend Jake cheating on her, becomes involved with a guy called Julian, who is Della Lee's ex-boyfriend, uh, who is abusive to her, and he is kind of this kind of cowboyish romantic type character trying to seduce Chloe away and for the longest time I had assumed that he had murdered Della Lee and dumped her in the river but apparently he, he didn't he's just in other ways a bad person he's almost cartoonishly evil in the the scenes that he's in at the end of the novel so that was a little bit disappointing and unbelievable but um I guess that again that storyline did come to a satisfying conclusion overall 
I did really enjoy the book. It didn't have as much magic stuff in it as the predecessor like garden spells, which I guess was more about like witchy families. This felt like it was a lot more about like guardian angels and stuff. There are in fact quite a few pictures of angel wings on the cover, which again gives away the central, I guess, mystery of, of the book. It's more about that and it's more about secrets than it is about magic powers. But the ones that were in there, like the books appearing all the time and these little charms and things that people do around the town, that was still pretty enjoyable. And I did like it as a, a use of like magical realism. I also really warmed to Della Lee as a character. She's quite funny uh, in most places because she's just living in Josie's closet, criticising her outfits, telling her she needs to make more of herself and, and be more confident. Basically telling her everything that her mum never will because it seems like her mum is just trying to do Josie down, telling her she looks terrible in red and should never wear makeup when in actuality red is her best colour and it frightens her mother to see her becoming beautiful because she's afraid that Josie will leave her and then she'll have no one. Uh, so so things like that, uh, I really liked Della Lee as a character. She also comes across as like kind of beautifully tragic um, because sometimes she talks about heaven. Uh, there's a bit where Josie is telling her the story of her first kiss and Della Lee says that she hopes that heaven is as good as a first kiss. So she kind of has this knowledge that she is dead the whole time. Um, so, so that's quite interesting and when you get to the end of the book and that is confirmed I guess a second read through would be warranted to pick up on all those moments. There is a certain amount of comedy as well in like the, the kind of small town portrayals of these absolute characters who live there. It reminded me a lot of like Fanny Flag novels like Fried Green Tomatoes, uh, Daisy May and the Miracle Man, those sort of things that have these like absolute kooky characters from small town areas in America. So. That was very similar and I'm just going to read you a little section from page 146 which is the description of Nova Berry, like the wise woman. This is like the only time we really see her uh, but I thought it was a nice indication of like the writing style so I'm just going to read that for you now. Nova Berry looked like a hickory switch, tall, thin and knobbly. She could trace her family line back hundreds of years in the Appalachian Mountains these days, people treated what she did as a novelty, but there was a time when the Berry women were known far and wide for their natural remedies. Slippery elm for digestive problems, red clover for skin conditions, pot marigold for certain monthly female ailments. Nova had been forced to spice things up a bit now that there were things like Malux and Midol on the market so easily acquired, so she made it known that her cure for heartburn also mended a broken heart, and her cure for cramps also made you more fertile, or less, if that's what you wanted. Half the time it really worked, because if it was one thing generations of Berry women knew, it was that confidence was the primary ingredient in every potion. Nova's children ran the market, and Nova had her own workroom in the back. Josie led Chloe there, pushing back the curtain that separated it from the rest of the store. Nova was sitting at her workbench, crushing lavender with a mortar and pestle, listening to Patsy Klein on the CD player her grandchildren had given her. She looked up when they entered. Josie, I have your mother's peppermint oil right here. Please tell her I'm sorry it took so long. There was a sudden outbreak of constipation that kept me busy. She got to her feet and gave Josie a small glass vial. Josie discreetly gave her the cash for it. Nova stuffed it into her bra. Now, can I interest you in a scarf this time? She gestured to the corner of the room, which was an explosion of yarn, in baskets, on shelves. She knitted two or three scarves a week, and they were hanging everywhere, even alongside bundles of dried herbs. Red is your magic colour, Josie. Try red. So you can see some of those like elements of magical realism and those sort of characters and witchy things woven into the story. There are other little occurrences like Josie having this lucky red sweater that she believes is magic and there's a cab driver who comes from a family in town who when they make you a promise they are physically incapable of breaking it. Um, which is also like an interesting kind of thing. Once again, I did like all those background characters and those background suggestions of magic as well. So I can recommend this book. It is, as I said, on occasions a little bit predictable, but I think I'm 80% sure that that is by design and that the reader is meant to know about Della Lee not being actually just a person hiding in a cupboard. They make that section really believable, like you fully believe that she's the kind of weird person who would just turn up and be like, I have to live in your cupboard now because my life has gone to shit. And 
very convincing explanations for things are in there but the fact that she's described as a fairy godmother in the blurb the angel wings on the cover how she turns up like dripping wet and only with one shoe and the way she talks about heaven and things like that it, i think it's very obvious for the reader that she is dead and that we are meant to be offset from josie as josie discovers this for herself there are other mysteries and things in the book uh, relating to what Josie's dad was getting up to and his various infidelities. So it's by no means like a, a huge spoiler because there's so much other stuff going on in the plot as well. I do think that you should give it a chance. If you liked Garden Spells, if you've gone on to read that, as I said, that one was basically just practical magic, but as a book, which I'm aware is already a book, but the movie Practical Magic as a book. I'm now going to go read First Frost, which is the sequel to Garden Smells, and hopefully that will be just as delightful and magical as the book that I've just finished reading. In the meantime, if you have other magical realism novels you'd like me to check out, or any books in general, do let me know. I am slowly moving back towards getting through my book pile, which is very exciting, but at the same time, the gaps on the shelves frighten me, and I need to fill them up with stuff, lest the integrity of the book pile be ruined forever. So... Get in touch in any of the usual ways, check the description box for more information, and I'll see you in the next one. 